2015, an elite DFS Army Commando unit formed to bring high-level DFS strategy to the masses. Today, hated by DFS sharks and lineup sellers alike, they continue their quest to turn Joe into DFS Pro. U.S. Open version of the Taco Tuesday PGA DFS podcast, presented to you by DFSArmy.com. Sign up today using the link in the description and use promo code TACO for a lifetime 20% off. You'll be able to access all of our premium content for every daily fantasy sport there is. So go there today, DFSArmy.com, check us out. Are you ready for the U.S. Open? Because I am ready for the U.S. Open. It's going to be a good one this year. The DraftKings contests are pretty huge. Just like uh, we saw at the Masters, there's a millionaire maker. A lot of the public will be in these giant GPP contests. Uh, The difference is that uh, a lot of the lower entry GPPs have been changed from a limit of 50 entries to only 20 entries this week. So this will kind of push people up into the higher dollar entry fees like like DraftKings has been trying to do on every single sport, trying to get the major tournaments up to like the $8 mark, uh, probably pretty soon the $10 mark. So it's a little different this week. You can't just go bananas in the low dollar entries where all the public's going to be. But at the same time, you're not going to have people pouring in 150 lineups and putting out a really good spread that way. Uh, It sucks for someone like me because I like to do exactly that. But for casual players coming in, it's going to be pretty nice for them. Uh, It'll be a very widely varied uh, public kind of tournament setup. And with this being a very interesting course setup, and the cut only being at 60 people, and with such a giant field, this is going to be a very tricky week to get 6 out of 6 of your guys through the cut on DraftKings and it'll be even harder to get 8 out of 8 in FanDuel and that's what you're going to have to do if you want to take down any of these giant GPPs so it's going to be a very tricky week but a 6 out of 6 or especially an 8 out of 8 is pretty much going to guarantee you a spot in the money unless all of the chalk hits or something. Um, It's very important to look at how the USGA sets up the US Open events and it's sort of similar year to year. This is a brand new course at Aaron Hills Golf Club in Wisconsin. Now I'm not a hundred percent sure about this but as long as I've been following golf I am pretty sure that this is the longest course that they have ever been at. It is 7,800 yards. That's ridiculous. Um, To put that into perspective, the longest course on tour is the Torrey Pines South course from the Farmers Insurance Open, which is right around 7,700 yards, just shy of that. This is an extra 1,000 yards, and that's already one of the toughest courses there is. And that course doesn't absolutely punish you for missing the fairway just like this course here does. That's like the number one thing about this course, besides its distance, is it just absolutely kills you if you get off of the fairway. Now, while Torrey Pines is perhaps the closest to it in distance, it's really hard to use Torrey Pines and the results from the farmers as a predictor for here because it's a multi-course event. They also play on the north course, which is completely different. And the setup is just a little different with the rough being a lot easier and it being a West Coast Poa Nua uh, style uh, tournament. But it is pretty slopey. So it is similar in that, in that way because Aaron Hills is ridiculously slopey. Just the greens aren't as ridiculously hard. And it's not set up to the supremely hard US Open course setup. Uh, some other similar courses. I think the most similar course to Aaron Hills would be uh, Chambers Bay, where they played the U.S. Open two years ago. 
Uh, last year's Oakmont is also a pretty good course, but I think the the course is very, very, very similar to Chambers Bay because the fescue was just as bad as it is here. Maybe not quite as bad, but they are trimming it down since the players have uh, complained about that quite a bit. There is a video on Twitter. Uh, Kevin Na just showed how ridiculously hard the brush was to get out of. It's pretty much like if you if you miss the fairway and hit this brush, you might as well just take a penalty stroke because that, that is gone. Um, I don't know how much it will change with being cut down. We'll have to see how players react to it over the next few days, but that's exactly what we saw at Chambers Bay, and we also saw the extreme slopiness come into play. You've got blind shots, huge uphill, huge downhill shots into wind, a very, very low amount of tree coverage, if any at all, and we'll also see that here at Aaron Hills. So I like Chambers Bay as the most relevant course in reference to Aaron Hills. Um, I also like the Quail Hollow Golf Club, where the Wells Fargo Championship is played every year. Uh, but they didn't play at Quail Hollow this year. They're playing that at the PGA Championship. And you might want to use this event uh, to predict the PGA Championship a little bit because the field will be very similar. And it'll be set up to a major standard. And that one's also about almost 7,600 yards. But we can't exactly go into the future and find out what happens there. But there is one more event that happened earlier this year that I'll also be using quite a bit to sort of predict what will happen here. And I added this one to the cheat sheet. It's the Abu Dhabi Championship that happened this January on the European Tour. And that is one of their biggest events of the entire year. The field is super strong. It had American superstars over there like Dustin Johnson and Ricky Fowler. And that course was over 7,600 yards. Pretty similar setup to here. Some really bad roughs and the bunkers were also sort of crater-like. So I like using that event in reference to this one as well. But for this week, the strategy for me is going to be based on a few different factors. First off, scores are going to be considerably lower as we see this all the time with US Open events. The cut line is going to be extremely high. People are going to post almost exclusively positive numbers on their scorecard. Maybe a few guys will be around even par or even a few strokes under par. But in general, it's not going to be a minus 18 winning this week. It's going to be like minus 5 to minus 7. And that's going to keep people out of the 90 and 100 point range and kind of like push the top scores down into the 70, 80 uh, fantasy point range, which means that it's all about making the cut this week, all about making the cut. Having the winner, the top five guys, that will surely help, but you need, you absolutely need to get people through the cut. And then on top of that, when they make the cut, they have to score. They can't just go plus 10 on Friday, or on Saturday, I mean, and put up like five DraftKings points. They're going to need to at least just par everything or something, put up some kind of scoring. Now, you will need to be able to predict all of these top 10 guys if you're going to go for broke and try to win these humongous tournaments. You pretty much need to have everyone in your lineup in the top 10. And that could be a very hard task, but... We do have a few extra tools available this week that we usually don't. And that's going to be another huge part of my game plan. Utilizing all of these extra Vegas odds that we get on a week like this to our advantage. I've already put it on the cheat sheet. And I've got the implied odds of making a top 20, top 40 finish, and then making the cut. And converted that into percentage. It's a little tiny bit juiced up. So if someone's at like 90% chance to make the cut, it's really more like 85% or so. Because uh, obviously books always add a little bit of juice to things. But uh, these stats are supremely helpful. And I honestly wish we had these stats every week. But we don't. So we've got to enjoy them while we've got them. Let the books do a lot of work for us. Especially since they know that the public is going to be oh so involved. This will sort of bump up numbers for some of your bigger names, but usually in golf, that only really affects like Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods, and we should not have either of them in the field. 
Uh, it would take a very long weather delay for Phil Mickelson to even be able to play in the field. So you can pretty much scratch him and hope the public plays him, which I bet they will. Sort of like sort of like DJ at the Masters. Just don't worry about it. Chances are he won't play. And if anything, Phil would be a terrible play here because he's just always finding the rough. And the rough here is just absolutely super hard to get out of. So using these extra Vegas odds, going to be very important. And the last part of my strategy is it's so obvious what kind of statistical player we're looking for here. The course fit just makes a ton of sense. You absolutely need to not only have distance, but accuracy off of the tee. So first thing I look at when I'm looking for a player this week, can they drive the ball far? Because with 7,800 yards of distance, you absolutely need to hit the ball far. But you cannot miss these very, very wide and forgiving fairways. Uh, I'm really just going to be avoiding people that are very, very bad at driving, uh, driving accuracy. And I'll be okay with people with just all right accuracy. Because these are very forgiving fairways. Just if you do get into trouble, you are screwed. And then following that, strokes gained approach is going to be very important here. Because the greens are going to be really tough to land on. They're super slick. And they're oftentimes incredibly slopy and undulating. And with a real lack of a fringe and sort of the greens going right onto these super low cut fairways, they're just going to keep rolling and rolling and rolling. They're very slopy, sort of like the Masters. Uh, you can chip a ball on and it just keeps going and going and going. Roll off the green and then just start collecting speed and fall down to these collection areas. So a solid approach game, as usual, is going to be crucial here. And you'll also need... A strong approach game because a lot of these par fives are over 600 yards there's one that's 660 yards so people are not going to be hitting the ball on the green in the second shot they're going to be taking lots of layup shots and the placement on the par fives is going to be important uh, these par fives are just so important because that's where all of your fantasy scoring is going to come from and every single one of them is set up so that the way that you would think to hit the ball is not a good idea because they have sand traps in the worst possible spots and you need to place your ball farther away than you would like. You can't really go the way of the crow. So this course plays even longer than it is because of how the course setup is and how nasty some of these super disgusting bunkers are just placed right in front of the green and right over where you would want to attack from. So overall ball striking, it's just going to rain king this week. Um, I'm not really worried about uh, scrambling stats very much this week because it's pretty cut and dry here. You, you don't have your normal rough. You really don't. It's You either hit it in the fairways, and the fairways are pretty much like hitting it off of a green basically with how slick they are or you're in the disgusting brush and fescue uh, a lot of your typical scrambling isn't really going to matter here so strokes gained around the green I'm kind of fading that stat um, usually with putting stats on these really tough greens and uh, by the way these are very large and very 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 slick greens with an over 13 stimp meter rating, and they're set to championship level like we usually see at these US Open events, but they're going to be incredibly slick, incredibly slopey. I think you're going to need a solid set of putting skills to do well on this course. I, I think bad putters are going to get into a world of trouble. So the kind of player I'm looking at is someone with great total driving, that can hit the ball very long with some accuracy. Great ball striking on approach shots. And then the ability to make damn sure they two putt every single one of these super tough putts. And and, and this is just this is just a super hard course to putt on. Because every single green is undulated like crazy. 
um, you have to you have to get up over some really big slopes to get up on these plateaus. Uh, the the pin placement is disgusting on a few of these holes, and you're gonna need to learn how to how to navigate and how to lag putt just to be able to save par or even save bogey on some of these holes. So that's what I'm looking at this week. Just super key. Not it wouldn't be as focused on birdie or better percentage as much as usual. Uh, going to focus a lot more on these raw stats, being able to stick it on the greens and all the driving distance, and you just can't have super bad accuracy. Um, another thing that will come into play this week, and I don't know how it will affect tee times yet because we won't really know until Wednesday, but it's going to get rainy on Friday evening. There will be some thunderstorms. They'll probably cause a delay. Saturday looks like it's a complete wash as of right now. Uh, it should rain like all day. Um, I don't know if we'll have any U.S. Open golf on Monday, but it's not looking too hot. And the wind is going to uh, not be the worst wind, but it will matter a lot, especially with gusts, just because there's absolutely no tree coverage. So things could get a little bit shaky out there. And who knows, maybe a tee time advantage will come up. We'll definitely look into that on Wednesday. But anyway, just moving right into this super stacked major field. We're starting off with Dustin Johnson at 12,000. Pretty typical. Uh, last year we finally saw him win his first major. Super long overdue. He pretty much won Chambers Bay. He just gave it up to Spieth at the last second just because he... He had like the worst three putt of all time. Uh, kind of a funny story about that. Um, if he won the U.S. Open, uh, his sponsor TaylorMade was doing this contest where people could buy a brand new driver from them, and they would refund the price of it if Dustin Johnson won the U.S. Open. And then he just gags it away in the last two holes. It's it's got to be so tilting for so many people that bought that driver. I personally think it might have been an inside job, but I have no evidence to back that up. It's just a hunch. I'm just saying DJ really should be coming off of two straight U.S. Open championships. He's the clear favorite at 8-1 to one over Spieth, Rory, and Day at 14-1 to one currently. Uh, he's finished top five at the last three U.S. Opens, all on different courses, but all set up the same. Uh, course history is going to be, well, not really course history, but event history. It's going to be somewhat important because U.S. Opens can uh, usually be compared to other U.S. Opens. Even though they're different courses, it's the same sort of setup. Just obviously don't put as much stock into course history as you usually would on a week like this. Uh, just kind of note it. Some guys are just good at the setup. Dustin Johnson's one of those guys. Uh, but... He pretty much just makes sense as far as like uh, driving distance. He's one of the best in the field. You've, he's easily the favorite pretty much because he's magical with the driver. Uh, and a place with uh, super wide fairways, super long holes, uh, that, just, that just sounds like a place where you would play Dustin Johnson. Think back to Abu Dhabi. He finished T2 there. Didn't get to play the Masters this year. Still probably salty about that. Dustin Johnson, the best player on the board, easily. Going to be one of the highest owned options. Even with him coming off of a cut at the Memorial, or a missed cut, um, that might keep him down possibly under the 30% mark, but it really should be a situation where he's like 35 to 40% owned. Probably pushing about 40% owned if it weren't for that missed cut. So... I like him a lot. I really don't see a situation where he finishes worse than like top 20. Right now, if you look at the cheat sheet, he's by far the best in implied top 20 percentage at 73% with an 88% implied percentage of making the top 40 and 91% making the cut. Um, that kind of speaks for itself there. You know what to do with DJ. He's just awesome. Um, Jordan Spieth is the second most expensive, 11-5. He's coming off a few solid outings in a row. Second at the Dean and DeLuca. A T13 at the Memorial. 
after a few really shaky missed cuts in a row. Uh, he wasn't a factor on Sunday at the Masters, but he was looking like he was going to be after Saturday. Um, he doesn't have the driving stats at all that we're looking for this week, but you know he is a really good putter. He plays great at majors. He always rises to the event. If there's anyone that you just ignore the statistics of, it's going to be Jordan Spieth here. Now, will he be popular? Not sure. Not sure. Not nearly as popular as DJ. Um, Rory should be more popular than him, but there's a little bit of concern here with his withdrawal from the, his uh, BMW championships over in Europe recently. Uh, he's 11-2, and he really should be a super popular option with his ability to drive the ball a little more inaccurate than DJ, but as far as gaining strokes gained off the tee, over the last few years, he's been the best on tour, even better than DJ, just long term, and the dude's pretty much money any place that he goes. He's he'll he'll top ten more often than not. Uh, he's won here before, back in 2011. Well, not here, but you know, won a U.S. Open. I expect him to be more popular in the higher stakes than lower stakes because people might be a little little concerned about him. I think he'll be fine, honestly, and he makes a whole lot of sense here. Uh, Jason Day at 10,800. Uh, four straight top 10 finishes in U.S. Opens and five out of six there with a couple of runner-ups. Uh, sort of like Spieth. Shaky sort of form, uh, but coming off of a few really good finishes in a row. His driving accuracy numbers are still kind of bad, but they're not like super bad like they were earlier in the season they're getting a lot better and you know his putting's there his scrambling is really there but i don't think that helps a whole lot uh, it's just his approach game is it's been incredibly shaky all year long and that's the thing i worry about with him the most i just really 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 don't like his accuracy off of the tee and with his irons because you just you can't afford to get into trouble here it's too bad it's just going to cause double and triple bogeys and just ruin people's day. Do, do you get it? I made a joke. Ruin people's day. But anyway, anyway. Uh, day won't be incredibly popular. He's great at US Opens. He makes sense if you want to play him. But you can also fade him and hope that he gets into trouble off of the tee and off of his approaches. Uh, for $300 less... And significantly less on FanDuel, my first super FanDuel play, who will be the chalk on FanDuel. That's Ricky Fowler at 10,500 on DraftKings, 9,200 on FanDuel. Uh, he's coming off of a miscut at the St. Jude, but the week before that, he had just finished second at the Memorial. He was looking amazing, absolutely amazing, all up until last week, pretty much in there in every tournament he's in. Uh, leading the PGA Tour in stroke average. Uh, I think just slightly worse than Jordan Spieth now. Uh, I think the leader in overall adjusted stroke average would be Sergio Garcia, but still top three. Even after the poor performance last week, um, he's missed the cut at the last two U.S. Opens, which is kind of concerning, but finished second in 2014. Um, Fowler just... He's going to be an interesting play. I'd say just play him on FanDuel and fade him on DraftKings, but I think everyone is going to do that. Like I think he's going to be the chalk on FanDuel. Uh, I think that this is just a situation where you play Ricky Fowler. Uh, statistically, he's what we're looking for. His numbers have him at above average on driving distance and significantly above average in driving accuracy. Not like one of the best on tour or even in the field but still significantly better than the likes of DJ and Rory and Spieth and especially Day uh, I think that's a great combo to have here and he's going to have the freedom to just hit it with the driver all he wants um, statistically looks like the best player in the entire field outside of maybe Dustin Johnson honestly like and maybe, maybe John Rahm but we'll talk about Rom in a second here. Um, Fowler just looks to be in a really great spot. 
uh, kind of expensive on DraftKings. I mean, I, don't, I think everyone will prefer to play Rom for two hundred dollars less. But on Fanduel, he's just going to be so chalky. You might not want to play him there because his ownership's going to be like forty percent or more. But maybe not. Maybe not because of that recent miscut. Just he's just really underpriced over there. Um, John Rom, he's. I mean, you've got to consider him as like the mini Dustin Johnson at this point, but not even like mini, just like 90% Dustin Johnson. Uh, missed the cut along with Dustin Johnson at the Memorial. Um, more expensive than Rory McIlroy on FanDuel. So that's kind of interesting to see. But I still think he's a great play because if you look at his game, of all the elite bombers, Rory, Day, McIlroy, he is the best at driving accuracy, and he's still super long off the tee. Uh, I think he's the best in the entire field at strokes gained off the tee, and that's going to be so important here, just so important. Uh, finished top 25 last year at Oakmont, and that's kind of encouraging to see. Um, he would be like 100% owned if he didn't miss the cut at the Memorial. So that's kind of an interesting angle there. I'm pretty much all in back on rom don't give a crap about his memorial performance uh the dude is a beast just play him on both sides i actually especially like him on fan duel because even though he's ten thousand four hundred, that's still pretty cheap you can easily afford to play him with dustin johnson and that like you should not be able to put dustin johnson and rom in a lineup together but you can and you should and it's a great week, too, because they're both coming off of missed cuts. I don't think that combo will be popular, but if you asked me like two months ago or even a month ago what the most popular combo would be for the U.S. Open, I'd say very easily Rom and DJ. So I'm still all about that combo right now. The dude has top one upside. I think he can win here. Uh, he's played her twice before, actually. Made the cut back in 2013 as an amateur. Um, not worried about Rom at all. He's picture perfect for the course, and this is my favorite play of all of the elites outside of Dustin Johnson. Uh, but my second favorite play, well, I guess third favorite play here, um, that's Sergio Garcia, the ball striker. Um, statistically, is perfect, exactly what we're looking for here, outside of some really bad putting. Um, just won the Masters. That always helps. And he's made every single cut at the U.S. Open, like ever. And with a lot of top 10, top 20 finishes as well. Including a top 5 finish last year and a top 20 finish at Chambers Bay. Uh, I think he's going to be really popular in FanDuel right there with Ricky Fowler as he comes in at only 9600 And he's the last $10,000 player at exactly $10,000 on DraftKings. Um, he should make for a great cash play. He has done well at every single tournament he's played at this year. I think he's top 30 in every single tournament. Not only won the Masters, won overseas not too long ago. Um, Sergio looks like a great play for both sides. And right after him, you have a almost identical play in Justin Rose. Uh, he was in the playoff with him in the Masters. Uh, but his top 20, top 40... And make the cut odds are all exactly the same. The only difference being he's twenty-five to one to win, with Sergio being twenty-six to one to win as of right now, and he's a little bit cheaper. So Rose makes a lot of sense. He's a former U.S. Open winner. He did miss a l the cut last year at Aaron Hills, and statistically, he's not quite the accurate driver and ball striker that Sergio is, but he's a a better putter, or at least not terrible, just kind of a little bit under average. And his scrambling game's just a little better, but that that doesn't really matter. It, they're pretty much even plays, just I think I think Sergio's history here, like consistent history here, and him winning the Masters will make him a little higher owned. And I think Rose isn't like a picture perfect pivot right off of him. At 9,800, and especially at 9,300 on FanDuel. I think he's going to be a little more popular on FanDuel. But I like him on DraftKings a lot. Uh, I think he's just as safe as Sergio to make the cut. And honestly, just playing them both, probably not a bad way to start a team at all. 
Now, right underneath them both, you've got Hideki Matsuyama, priced $9,600 on both sides. Uh, just like Rose, good course history here, but missed the cut last year. Uh, has been making the cut all year, just the finishes haven't quite been that great since finishing 11th at the Masters. He's been just alright. Um, T to green, he's great. Not the greatest putter. Um, the approach game historically has been an awesome player as far as strokes gained approach goes. Uh, just not as great this year, but still decent. Still, he's a good total driver. Um, not the longest, but about as long as Rose. In fact, according to the statistics here, exactly as long as Rose. And just average at driving accuracy. Um, I like that combo a lot. I like the fact that he won't be as popular as Rose and Sergio. And he comes in at the same make-the-cut odds as those two. Uh, just cheaper outside of FanDuel. Uh, cheaper on DraftKings. And will possibly come in with lower ownership. So, like I'm saying, for most of these studs, makes for a good play. You could really kind of pick and choose who you want up here. It's never the studs you have to worry about. You always want to play the studs. It's about finding guys lower down the docket, and we'll get into there. Um, a guy that is certainly going to be a low-owned, Henrik Stenson, uh, just finished third out at the BMW overseas, and that's a pretty strong field. Uh, 16th at the Players, 8th at the Abu Dhabi tournament earlier in the year. Um, I think he sets up very sneakily well for the U.S. Open. He makes a cut here every year, except last year he started off poorly and just withdrew. Um, kind of concerning there, and obviously his really bad form coming in until recently is pretty concerning, but one thing I do like about him is while he's not the longest off the tee, honestly, his driving accuracy has historically been the best of anyone in the world. <laughs> um, he might have to put his three wood in the bag and just let it rip with his driver, which he hates doing. But the fairways are so forgiving that he'll probably be able to manage just fine. And his approach game is always really good. Uh, even this year, his numbers are pretty <laughs> pretty up there. Not, not quite as good as Spieth's, but pretty solid um with that ownership that he's projected to come in at maybe like five to eight percent ownership overall i think that stenson makes for a very sneaky nice play on both sides he's somewhat fairly priced maybe a little over a bit overpriced compared to uh his recent performance but i'm not too worried about it if anything a higher price makes for even lower ownership so i'm all about stenson this week um at $9,000 and $8,400 on DraftKings, or on FanDuel, uh, you've got Brooks Kepka who will come in in a very interesting place. Since finishing T11 at the Masters, he went from having terrible form to having uh, some pretty awesome consistent form. Finished second in Texas and has made all six of his cuts since the Masters. Um, he's super long off the tee, you know that. But his driving accuracy has actually been there this year. It's just his approach game, which is god-awful. Uh, that's the only thing that really concerns me here. But his U.S. Open history is quite awesome. Three straight years of top 20 finishes at the U.S. Open. So he's going to be a very interesting person to look at, especially on FanDuel. But it's his approach game that really worries me. If he does make the cut then I actually do like him quite a bit on weekend golf because he's such a high, like, birdie or, percent or birdie or better percentage guy. It's just that Brooks finds a way into trouble quite a bit, and that is just a killer, absolute killer here at this course because you're going to put up some high numbers if you can't stay out of trouble here. And I'm, I'm just kind of worried about Kepka in that regard, but I do like how his driving accuracy numbers are actually better than average and a lot better than a lot of these bombers in the upper tier here. So he's definitely going to require a fair amount of exposure to. Um, at $8,800 on DraftKings and $9,500 on FanDuel, you've got Adam Scott, who has also put up three straight top 20 finishes at the U.S. Open. And historically, as someone 
that is like the pinnacle of ball striking. Uh, his ball striking numbers are starting to get a lot better uh, on tour recently. And if you think long term, his stroke scanned approach game, <laughs> that kind of rhymes, stroke scanned approach game, uh, over the last two or three years has been by far the best of anyone outside of maybe Stenson. Uh, so he can he can definitely uh, manipulate these really tough to hit greens, and you know he's got the distance. He's always had the distance. So Scott is someone that you really don't want to sleep on at all. Just he's gonna be really hard to afford on Fanduel. Uh, someone easy to afford on Fanduel is eighty six hundred on DraftKings, seventy seven hundred dollars on Fanduel, uh, and has finished top five. And the last two years here at Oakmont and Chambers Bay is Brandon Grace. His form has improved a lot recently. Um, last time we saw him, top 10 at the BMW Championships overseas. Uh, made the cut and did pretty well at the Masters. We saw him finish top 10 at Texas. Uh, finished T13 at Abu Dhabi, but was in contention right until the very end there. Uh, Grace is someone that really can't be overlooked on FanDuel. Might be a little bit chalky, but since he's a foreign guy for the most part, uh, I could see him definitely flying under the radar, at least enough to keep him maybe in the 20% threshold. But at 7700 that's just way too cheap for him over there on FanDuel. So you pretty much have to play him in cash, especially with how good he is at these US Open setups. And very good in the wind. Very good if things kind of get a little... A little shaky out there. Um, so I like Brandon Grace a lot. Right underneath Grace on DraftKings, you've got Phil, who's most likely not going to play. Um, don't play him. Um, and then Paul Casey comes in at 8,400. Casey has been rock solid this year. Like in cash games, that's a super strong play. A little more expensive on FanDuel, 8,800. But 8,400 on DraftKings, that's a very nice like third player to plug into your lineup. He's awesome in these strong fields. Uh, T6 at the Masters. Uh, we haven't seen him since the Dean and DeLuca a few weeks ago, uh, but he finished T10 there. He's been on a roll of really awesome form, and I think he's going to be popular. Uh, the only issue is that he's historically struggled at U.S. Opens quite a bit. Uh, missed the cut last year at Oakmont. Uh, made the cut the last three years, but no finishes better than T39. Uh, he always plays better at the Masters than at the US Open, but really if you post a top 20 finish, he's gonna be solid and he really does have a chance to. I don't see a reason why he wouldn't be able to. Maybe not like the longest off of the tee, but a little longer than average with some accuracy to go with it. And pretty decent ball striking. And he's really gonna stay out of trouble. High green and regulation percentage. Uh, so Casey, I might focus on more in cash than GPP. Um, Justin Thomas is the exact opposite. He is all GPP. Uh, we last saw him T4 out at the Memorial. Um, he really does make for a picture-perfect play here. Very long off the tee. Good ball striker. Great approach game. It's just he can get into trouble. Sort of like uh, Brooks Kepka. He... I don't know. It's just If he gets into trouble, it's just going to be a killer on this course. So... Guys like Justin Thomas I sort of worry about, but at the same time, he's also very mindful of how crappy it's going to be, and with the fairways being so wide and forgiving, uh, he might be able to keep it under control just enough. I don't think he's like totally reckless out there, and his approach shots are going to be quite awesome. So I like Justin Thomas, just GPP only. Uh, following him... Is Bubba Watson at 8,200 on DraftKings, but more interestingly, 6,700 or 6,500 on FanDuel, which is super cheap for Bubba. But uh, he was initially at 80 to 1, and even with a T6 finish at the Memorial, still only 70 to 1 odds for Bubba, which is incredibly low for him at a major. But, uh, Sort of like Paul Casey, he's historically much, much better at the Masters, which he's won twice, than the U.S. Open. 
He's missed three of his last five cuts here, and in his last six times at the U.S. Open, he's finished no better than T32. Um, so not a great track record to begin with. An adjusted stroke average this year of 72, which is just ridiculously bad. Uh, his form was absolutely garbage, just flashed some really nice form at the Memorial, but that's just one tournament. Um, obviously, he's got the distance. That's not even the question. He's even put up decent driving accuracy this year. But the way that the PGA Tour does things is, like, statistically, you're going to need some made cuts to really come up with a lot of uh, your sample you're going to use statistically because they don't put out any stats if you miss the cut. And you just kind of have to deal with that. That sucks. But um, he only has four events where he's made the cut this year, even including the swing season. Uh, that's not that great. Um, but from what we can see, he's abysmal around the green. And that's forgivable. Um, good at ball striking. Obviously off the tee, he's great. Approach, he's just average at. And putting, he's kind of just average at. So he really only makes for an interesting flyer shot on FanDuel. I wouldn't play him on DraftKings because people are still going to play Bubba Watson. He's a big name. A lot of the public knows who he is, and he's coming off of a strong finish. Um, underneath him, you have a few recent winners. Jason Duffner, who just won the Memorial Tournament, and Daniel Berger winning last week at the St. Jude Classic. Um, Duffner is pretty interesting. Just a decent total driver, slightly above average in distance and accuracy, but he was crushing the ball when he won the Memorial, um, hitting it over 300 yards constantly. So he makes for a very interesting play, always a great ball striker. And then Daniel Berger, you know he's a little longer off the tee, not bad accuracy, an even better ball striker so far this year. And another great ball striker, even better than Berger and Duffner so far this year, coming in at 7,900, just uh, a little bit cheaper than those two. Uh, Kevin Chappell, who's also uh, just won recently, his first ever win on tour back at the Valera Texas Open. All three of these guys are really nice plays, and uh, Berger and Chappell are especially nice on FanDuel, where they're 6,800 and 6,700. Uh, definitely some of my favorite plays on FanDuel. So on both sites, Duffner, Burger, Chapel represent a ton of value in this low $8,000 range. And um, after them, a couple of really nice plays. I, I know I'm saying it about a lot of people here, but there are just some really nice plays all up in this range. You've got Brant Snedeker, who is historically awesome at U.S. Opens. He had five top 20 finishes in a row until he missed the cut last year. Um, always a great putter, so he'll be able to navigate these greens. Um, every other stat he's just average at outside of driving distance, which is admittedly very, very poor. Um, not the longest off of the tee. So that's the great concern here at a 7,800-yard course. But the dude can putt. He can absolutely manage these uh, these greens. It's just... It's just too long of a course for him, I think. I don't think anyone will be off of him or be on him. Uh, still have some, he still has some injury concerns. He just finds a way to make it happen. He can play in the wind really well, um, really well adjusted to these U.S. Open conditions. He's played it a lot. I don't know. I wouldn't be too surprised if I see Snedeker sticking around. It just seems like it's a little too long of a course for him. Now, I think he's going to be incredibly low-owned, along with Chapel and Berger and Duffner here. They're going to be lower-owned than expected, and it's just because of the guys directly underneath them. You have three or four guys who are going to draw in massive ownership, and that starts with Thomas Peters at 7,700, 7,400 on FanDuel. Um, his odds are 44 to 1 compared to Snedeker's 100 more that's 96 to 1. Um, Peters is coming in red hot, destroyed the Masters. He was the first round leader and was in contention all through Sunday. Ended up finishing T4. Uh, we last saw him at the BMW Championships overseas, finished T14. Uh, the dudes won on the European Tour recently, 
currently the 25th best golfer in the world, according to the official world golf rankings. Uh, Peters is getting talked up already. The stats don't really show it yet, but I only have two samples from PGA Tour events, but if you follow him on Euro, it's pretty obvious what he's good at. He's super long off of the tee and drives it with some accuracy. I mean, it's exactly what we're looking for. His make the cut odds or implied odds is 78%. And I'm not really sure how chalky he'll be exactly. I just know that this range here is going to be chalky because after Peters, we have Matt Kuchar, who was good at pretty much every major and has four top 12 finishes in his last six events. Uh, and is pretty much a lock for all cash games. Then you have Kevin Kisner, who won at the Dean and DeLuca and followed that up with a T6 showing at the Memorial. Also went to a playoff at the Zurich Classic. So uh, he's just been awesome all year long. Beginning to end, he's just outside of a missed cut at the Wells Fargo. He's just been on a tear this year and he's broken into the top 20 in the official world golf rankings so kisner along with kutcher and peter is going to draw in tons of ownership and then the winner of the bmw championships alexander norin uh, that would be his fifth european tour win in the last half year or so uh, just absolutely incredible he's the eighth ranked golfer in the world at 7500 right there with kisner and then another 7,500 golfer, another European favorite, Tyrrell Hatton. So this range here is just going to be massive with the ownership. You've even got Louis Oosthuizen at 7,400, who shows up to play at every Masters, finished second at uh, Chambers Bay in 2015. He's going to be popular. Uh... Just this entire range here is going to suck in people's ownerships. I think people are going to take two studs, maybe an $8,000 guy, and then definitely one or two of these low $7,000 or mid $7,000 guys and maybe punt once and call it a day. Uh, this this whole range is going to be used and abused. Uh, people might even use Patrick Reed at $7,400. Uh, Tommy Fleetwood at $7,400 is also pretty interesting. Uh, the odds aren't exactly there, but... Uh, I called to Abu Dhabi as a course that's sort of similar to this one, and he won there. He edged out Dustin Johnson. Uh, he's missed three of his last four cuts, so that's not encouraging. Uh, missed the cut, the Masters, and the Memorial, but still makes for a somewhat interesting play. No one's going to own him just because of this whole range here and all of these great plays. Um, and then you hit the $7,300 range, and there are more good plays there. Uh, Charles Schwartzel, who just finished second last week at the St. Jude and has always done well at the U.S. Open. Uh, Shane Lowry, who finished second last year at Oakmont. And T9 at Chambers Bay and is coming off of two top 15 finishes in a row at the BMW Championship and the Memorial. He's going to be popular. Everyone knows he's great in the wind. He's great at total driving. Then you've got some bigger name PGA players, granted they're all bigger names because it's a major, but still, J.B. Holmes, everyone knows who he is. Uh, Bud Colley has been super popular on DraftKings, has one of the best looking game logs, and is only 5,800 on FanDuel. He's got to be super popular there. We have him projected as our top value on FanDuel at only 5,800, but even 7,300 on DraftKings, he's going to bring in some ownership. Uh, Steve Stricker, who always does well at the U.S. Open somehow and has good recent form. He's at 7,200. Uh, Adam Hadwin, um, he's been great all year. He's at 7,200 also. Um, this whole range is just loaded, and we see this oftentimes at majors. Just usually we see a lot of the uh, more interesting pricing has come in the six thousand dollar range and there are a few this week it's just the seven thousand dollar range is just loaded with value and there are definitely some really nice pivot options that nobody is going to own because of just the plethora of great plays in this range um one of them or a few of them could be uh from the seven thousand one hundred dollar range i don't think this range can be very popular at all you have Weisberger, Steele, Summer, Hayes, and Knox. Um, Weisberger would be 
the most obvious here. And sixty five hundred dollars on FanDuel, he's nice, but he's missed the last three cuts of the last three years at the U.S. Open. He's never done well here, but his form couldn't be any better than it is right now. Honestly, like. Uh, I'm just going to read his finishes, sort of like how I read Keimer's at the Masters, because it kind of speaks for it. It kind of speaks for itself, mostly on the European Tour, but all of the majors and a few different tournaments in America as well. But his recent finishes are 15th, 30th, 12th, 4th, a win at Shenzhen International, 43rd at the Masters, then T23, T17, T45, 3rd, T32, T37, 4th. 4th, 4th, 35th, 2nd, 7th, 5th, 2nd, 41st, 11th, and most recently missed the cut all the way back in the PGA Championships. So, since then, this man has been on a worldwide tear. He did the same thing in 2016 uh, without um, without the good finishes in America, but even here, he's finished 12th at the, at the Players, made the cut at the Masters. Uh, Finished T23 at the uh, Shell Houston Open. Uh, this is the Weisberger that I've been waiting a few years for. And I think he is poised to have a really nice U.S. Open for once. Because I'm looking for these total driving guys. And not only is he really starting to rocket off of the tee, his driving accuracy is insanely good. So as far as total driving looks, he's one of the best in the entire field and his approach game is rock solid as well one of the better marks on the tour or of all the people that I have statistics for in this field uh, he's not obviously he's not on the tour but Weisberger I love him a ton I'm going to be using a good amount of him and he's not really a name that at least people in the states know a whole lot. If you're overseas, you know darn well who Weisberger is, because, or even and if you play Euro golf especially, you know he's always one of the highest price options there. But he is so rock solid. He's just perfect off of the tee. I love Weisberger. I think he's going to post yet another top 30 finish because that's what he does. His make the cut props are at 64%. Not that encouraging, but I do like his top 40% of 39%, which is pretty darn solid for someone at 7100 and 6500 on FanDuel. Uh, same price on DraftKings, Brendan Steele has yet to miss a cut all year. Did pretty well at the Masters too. Um, I like Steele. He, his total driving is solid. Positive numbers in distance and accuracy. He's pretty much always been that way. And his approach game is also really good. So I like Steele. Um, then going down to the $7,000 range, a few guys that I love at pretty much every tournament. Keimer, Molinari, Hoffman. Love them all. Keimer, a former U.S. Open winner back in 2014. And Molinari, sort of like Weisberger, he's just been on an absolute tear. Uh, second at the BMW Championships. T6 at the Players. Uh, just a monster. Love Molinari. One of the best approach players in the game right now. And Keimer, uh, interesting with Keimer, the last time we saw him at the BMW Championship, he finally missed a cut after like 30 straight made cuts in a row. And that's going to sink his ownership because he's very popular at the Masters, if you remember. Ended up finishing T16 there. Uh, fourth at Abu Dhabi as well. Um, I, I want to get back on Keimer. I don't think he's going to miss another cut in a row. I think that uh, his game is pretty well suited for here. Uh, approach game, not the strongest, but total driving is pretty good. Maybe I wish he was a bit longer, but he's still slightly above average, but his driving accuracy is solid. Um, I just really do prefer Molinari uh, in this range over Keimer. And even though I like Hoffman and he's made a ton of cuts in a row, I'm kind of worried about him here just because of uh, this is some of the stats really don't show that much because the stats for him look good, um, really good at approach and all that. It's just the way he puts on the greens. Like he did well at the Masters, and if you watched him the whole time, the way he puts is he hits it like too hard, but 
when he's feeling it, he can just knock it in the hole every time. It's just that here at this course, if you're going to take such an aggressive like putting stance and you miss it on these really, really, really slick greens, you're just going to keep going and going and going. And when he gets in trouble, that's how he gets in trouble. His approach shots are great. It's just putting, he bleeds strokes, and he will bleed a lot of strokes if he takes an aggressive like downhill putt like you saw him doing at the Masters. So that's the only reason for concern there. Um, and also at $7,000, a guy who's going to go completely overlooked because of the likes of Keimer Molinari uh, and everyone else in this range. How Tong Lee is $7,000 on DraftKings, but what's very interesting is he's only $4,900 on FanDuel. Now, we have not seen him on FanDuel yet, and this will be a recurring theme that we see with some players that are playing in a FanDuel event for the first time since they don't have a European Tour product. Uh, Lee is one of the better European Tour golfers, but man, only 4900 on FanDuel? That's, that's just ridiculous. You have to play him. Um, don't have any stats for him on Tour. I did finish 30th at the BMW Championships a few weeks ago. Um, he's... He's known to be a pretty good driver of the ball, uh, pretty good total driving. Uh, that's one of the better parts of his game. And he has played on the PGA Tour before. He hasn't played the U.S. Open yet, but he played quite a bit over the last couple of years. Just we haven't seen him much this year. He's pretty much stayed on the European Tour. But Hao Tong Lee is going to be a very low, op or very low owned option, and I like him a lot as a very sneaky contrarian GPP play. Um, I expect Emiliano Grillo at 6,900 on DraftKings and 7,000 on FanDuel to be a popular option on both sites because he's a very solid, consistent cut maker. Um, pretty decent overall drive or overall driving. Pretty accurate of a ball striker. Not a bad option really. And I also don't mind Webb Simpson at 6,900 as well. He won the U.S. Open back in 2012. Uh, that's where he got his major victory. You know his approach game is awesome. Uh, he's just driving the ball a little short for me. That's the one concern I do have here. And he's a really bad putter. But I think he could also be like a 2% owned sneaky guy that people don't really like to roster because he's burned the public a lot when he's been chalk. But he's not going to be chalk one bit. And I guess he has what it takes to win a U.S. Open. Um... So I could see him doing pretty well here. Uh, in the $6,900 range, you'll have a few pretty popular names. A few guys at MDF uh, at the St. Jude Classic last week, Ryan Palmer and Peter Uline. Um, I expect Uline to be popular because he's very popular. He's a really nice looking game log. Just uh, maybe not so popular on FanDuel where he's only $5,900. Uh, I like him a lot on FanDuel. He won't really have a game log there outside of the few times he played on the U.S. tour, but he pretty much always finishes top 30, um, no matter where he's playing at. He's very, very, very consistent in making cuts. Uh, he'll be a nice play. I just prefer him on, dra uh, on FanDuel over DraftKings. And then Ryan Palmer is someone that people hate to play, but he's very long off the tee, very accurate off of the tee. I like him a lot for that reason, and I will be using some of him for sure. Uh, moving on down in this range, this is where we're starting to get into a lot of the European plays, and this will make up a ton of your uh, fan duel punt plays. Uh, Lee Westwood and Byung Hun An at $6,800 are going to be very important plays this week. Byung Hun An is going to be the chalk of all chalk, I think. Um, his game log is perfect literally perfect has not missed a cut all year outside of i do believe the zurich classic which doesn't even show up on DraftKings, and he's 6800 dollars. he could be 25 plus percent owned um, anyone who just uses the game log to select players like a lot of the public does in these majors they're going to see byung hung an see his like 11 for 11 or 12 for 12 cuts made and just lock him in at 6,800. And I can't really blame him either. He's known to be a very good total driver. Uh, good ball striker. Everything we're looking for here. And Lee Westwood 
always shows up for majors. Always. Has one of the best track records at the Masters of anyone that hasn't won. And is even good at the U.S. Open where he's made seven of the last eight cuts. So I think I'd prefer Westwood over and just to get off of that super high ownership. I'm not sure if Westwood will be popular. His odds are a little better than Ann's. It's just, uh, I mean, he still does have a pretty good looking game log. Three top 20s in his last four events, I do believe. Uh, finished eighth at Abu Dhabi. I mean, Westwood's a very known commodity to the DFS community, especially at majors. He's sort of like uh, Louis Oosthuizen, sort of that's the factoid that people know about him as he shows up to play from majors. So I think he'll still be a little bit popular, but he's a very, very good play. Um, for some reason, he's never high owned at the Masters, which boggles my mind, but he's usually a little higher owned in the U.S. Open because every year he kind of reminds people, like, oh, hey, he's good at ba he's good at majors, especially the Masters. But um, moving along, Lucas Glover at 6,800 on DraftKings and 5,600 on FanDuel. Seems like an awesome, awesome option. He's been really good this year, but he's missed the cut at the U.S. Open five times in a row. Granted, he's won. He won in 29, or 2009, not 29. That'd be a very long time ago, but 2009, he won the U.S. Open, but since then, he's been absolute garbage. <laughs> um, and his terrible, terrible putting is going to just tilt the crap out of him. I think. Um, I would like him otherwise. Great ball striker and very good at total driving. Um, rates about 0.5 uh, in both distance and accuracy. So half a standard deviation above the field in both of those regards. He just really has an awful track record here outside of winning it in the past. Um, and another player I really like is Stuart Sink. Another person has a really nice looking game log, but he's just been a top 25 machine this year. Looked great at the St. Jude Classic last week and also won a qualifier event to get into the U.S. Open. Um, he's really been on a resurgence this year. We've seen him play way better than in years past, and he's been driving the ball long for an old man. He was hitting at 308 yards at the uh, Memorial, I believe. Um, or last week at the St. Jude. I can't remember which one it was, but I saw that he was one of the tops in the field at driving distance, and I was like, wow. Um, just his driving accuracy is a little bit poor, uh, so GPP only play for sure, but the dude's putting like really well and driving it long. I, that's kind of the, the combo you want here. If he can stay out of trouble like he usually does, uh, he'll be all right. And... Uh, Moving down further into the $6,000 range, you've got a few really nice looking plays. You've got uh, Billy Horschel, who finished T4 last week at the St. Jude and won at the Byron Nelson. He's going to be popular. 4 for 4 and made cuts in U.S. Opens, T4 in 2013. Um, then you've got Mark Leishman at 6,700 as well. Uh, finished 18th here last year at Oakmont. And has been riding good form all season long. Uh, long term, he's known as a pretty good total driver. This year, his driving stats haven't been that great. I mean, still pretty good at distance, just very average at driving accuracy, if not a little bit below average. Uh, but he's still someone that just really has a nose for making cuts. And he almost won the, the British Open a couple of years ago. He really does bring it in these major events. And... Uh, also, Matthew Fitzpatrick at 6,700 here, and Jimmy Walker. Um, I like those guys as well. They have a pretty good chance of making the cut here. Uh, Fitzpatrick might be a little bit short, but he's a really good. Uh, he's really good at staying in the fairway. Uh, so if it becomes a war of attrition, I kind of like him a little more there, and I like him at 6,300 on Fanduel. Uh, Walker's just cheap on DraftKings. He's 8,000 on Fanduel. 6700 on DraftKings. That's just way too cheap for Jimmy Walker. Um, moving As we move along further, we keep seeing more of these European guys. Uh, Gregory Bordy finished top 20 here last year at Oakmont. So even though he's not the most, uh, he's not the longest off of the tee, he's a very accurate driver and good ball striker and good putter. I like him. Uh, Paul Dunn 
is 6,700 on, on DraftKings, but only 4,800 on FanDuel. Love him on FanDuel there. He's a pretty good golfer on the European Tour. Uh, finished 30th at the BMW Championship and 39th at the Abu Dhabi. Um, he doesn't play a whole lot, but when he does, he's usually pretty good. Um, then moving down, we've got JT Poston also at 6,700. And you know what he's like. Uh, he, he had been really, really good uh, until recently. I had just missed the cut at the St. Jude Classic, but uh, a really nice t uh, cut maker on tour. He's still a rookie, though, and I think uh, I might avoid him just because of that, but 5500 on FanDuel, that's that's a pretty darn good price. Um, we're, we're about to hit a bunch of these like FanDuel plays as we get into these European guys because Richie Ramsey is 4500 on FanDuel. That's kind of ridiculous. Um He's not like the best European Tour player, but he's pretty decent. Like if you play Euro Tour golf, he'll be about eight thousand, nine thousand dollars usually. Uh, Forty-five hundred—that's the dead bottom of the barrel. I think that's a great little punt right there, uh, Richie Ramsey, and uh, Bradley Dredge also um, pretty good, sort of upper echelon type uh, European Tour player. Finished 40th at the BMW and 18th at Abu Dhabi. Uh, his form isn't quite as good as it was last year. Um, he hadn't really played a whole lot, but uh, he's still a good golfer. And he's only 5,000 on DraftKings, so that's or on uh, FanDuel, so that's another option down there. And then Ross Fisher, who's one of the best European Tour players, he's only 6,600 on FanDuel. A little more appropriately priced on DraftKings, but on ah, uh, got it mixed up there. $5,900 on FanDuel, reasonably priced there, but $6,600 on DraftKings, and that's a mighty fine, uh, mighty fine price for him. We saw him come T22 at the Memorial. He made the cut at the Masters. Uh, overseas, he's been one of the better golfers on the European Tour, ninth at the BMW Championship, and top 20 at Abu Dhabi. Uh, Ross Fisher makes for a very strong play, and if you're just following odds compared to pricing, uh, he does stick out as a really good option. And then Graham McDowell is the same price at 6600 He's a former winner, won in 2010, uh, also runner-up in 2012. Uh, so he does have a good U.S. Open history, finished top 20 last year as well. And on the PGA Tour, he's been really solid, a top 30 machine. I made cut machine but uh the issue i have with mcdowell here is this is a 7800 yard course and he's pretty bad at driving distance he is a pure accuracy guy maybe if it's a war of attrition but i don't know man like he missed the cut at chambers bay and i think you need even more distance here kind of worried about playing him uh kind of the same thing goes for haas haas just He's 6,600, which seems very cheap for him, but he does not have the driving stats that I want. Uh, Pat Perez might be a popular option. He's been fantastic this year, just fantastic. 6,600 is pretty cheap. You probably want to play him some, but his driving stats are really nothing to write home about. Same with his approach game. I just, I do really like his putting, but I don't know if that will be as big of a deal here. Uh, I, don't, I just don't think you can, you can come in here with a poor driver and play. Like, like I would not take a single share of Jim Furyk. I don't care that he finished T2 last year and has a really good U.S. Open track record. He's missed like seven cuts in a row, and he's one of the worst in the field at driving distance. There's no way. So now we're into the fun part, and this is where it can have a lot of fun. The 6,500 and lower club, although... Before we get into there, I will mention a very quick play at 6,600 and 5,800 on FanDuel. Jonathan Vegas, anytime it comes to driving, I like Vegas a lot. So he's kind of interesting. Um, but 6,500 and under club, a few very good plays right from the get-go here. Chris Wood at 6,500, I think he's going to be somewhat popular, but he's someone whose odds have been rising quite a bit. And when we post the odds drifts, on Thursday morning or more likely Wednesday night 
he's going to be someone to pay attention to because I think that his odds are going to be shifted up even further. Right now, he's broken 150 to 1, and he started at like 250 to 1 a month or two ago. Uh, Chris Wood, very, very good player on the European Tour. Uh, finished top 25 last year at Oakmont. I expect him to get a little bit touted throughout the week. I think people are going to mention him. Um, and at 6,500, but more importantly, 4,800 on FanDuel, Jang Hoong Wang is a guy who um, has won multiple times on the European Tour, but he's certainly GPP only because if he's not winning, he's like, doing really bad uh, you would see him at like eleven hundred dollars playing european tour golf but uh his form has just been so inconsistent that it's all over the place but i like him a lot just because he really does know how to win out of nowhere um and i like Chez Revy at 6500 5300 on FanDuel. i think he's a great play for both uh both different sites there uh, fourth last week at the saint jude and his ball striking stats are among the best of anyone in the entire field. His driving accuracy is simply elite. He's not the longest off of the tee. In fact, he's a little above, a little below average, but it's not too bad. It's not like Jim Furyk bad. And his approach game is spectacular. So everything ball striking, the dude's got it going on. Just an average putter, slightly above average. I'm okay with that. I like Revy a lot on both sides. A few interesting names from Europe. You've got Aaron Rye at 6,500. He's kind of a hyped young guy there. You've got Matt Wallace at 4,600 on FanDuel. And he's won recently overseas. Um, Thomas Aiken at 4,800 on FanDuel, 6,500 on DraftKings. He's very interesting. I finished 13th at Abu Dhabi. Um, if you think back like the last like year, he's been spectacular on the European Tour. Just his last few events have not gone very well. Uh, missed the cut at the BMW Championship. But this is a guy who's not very long off the tee, mind you. So uh, kind of concerning there. But his driving accuracy is among the best in the entire world. Um, I do believe he played enough events to qualify for statistics. I think it was two years ago on the PGA Tour. Um, he's pretty much stuck to playing in the European Tour where he's among the leader in driving accuracy percentage. But I do believe it was two years ago. He led the PGA Tour in driving accuracy over guys like Stenson. So Aiken is definitely somebody that you can punt on FanDuel. And I think he has a reasonable chance to make the cut. Uh, just because he stays out of trouble and can strike it just so well. Um, a lot of scrubs in the $6,400 range. I don't think there's one good play, honestly. <laughs> Not one. And the same could really be said about the $6,300 range. Uh, there are some interesting names, like uh, Andres Romero at 6300 4900 on FanDuel. Uh, he's someone I'm going to take a few shots with personally. You don't see him on tour very often, and he missed the cut last week at St. Jude. Uh, but he has a few top five finishes over the last few years, and uh, apparently he had like the round of his life to make the U.S. Open in a qualifier. Finished T14 at Chambers Bay. I think he's just going to be a super, super low-owned option who might just I might just take a few shares of because... Uh, the guy can strike out of nowhere. And then a guy I'm not going to really play, but it's just an interesting story. At $6,200, Drew Love, as he's listed on the sites. Uh, but you might know him better as Davis Love the Fourth, son of famed golfer Davis Love the Third, who was the U.S. team captain last year for the Ryder Cup. Uh, It'll be Father's Day on Sunday, and granted, I don't think he'll be playing on Sunday. I think he'll have missed the cut by then, but with it being Father's Day weekend, the dynamic there is that his dad, Davis Love III, will be on the bag for his son's first U.S. Open. Um, I think it would be a really nice story if he made the cut, and they would definitely show him and his dad playing plenty of holes if that ends up somehow being the case. Uh, and him making the weekend playing on Sunday. That would be like the ultimate Father's Day thing. 
Um, as far as plays down here in the $6,200 range, it gets really bad. A lot of these guys are legitimate super scrubs and amateurs that just made it for some reason or another. You might see one or two of them up there for no real reason. Um, well, I mean, there'll probably be a reason. We'll probably get on these guys in the future, but uh, the U.S. Open, this is where amateurs come to make a name of themselves because there are, there are many different ways you can qualify and, like, local qualifiers but a lot of these guys are unknown commodities the only known commodities that we really have here are some web.com guys uh trey molinex is a rookie from the pga tour he hadn't done any well until a top 20 finish at the saint jude last week um he's very long off the tee though like super long just really inaccurate um at 6200 might as well take a shot maybe just sprinkle him in just a little bit um Bryce Garnett is a known uh, web.com guy. Uh, a lot of these other guys are just like, there's no information available on them whatsoever. So sort of in the same way that the Masters has a bunch of old former winners that play and you kind of avoid them. Uh, this is a situation where these are just a bunch of like random scrubby amateurs and you just don't play them. So even though... Only about a third of the field will make the cut, and it seems like it would be on paper a really tough week to get six out of six. Maybe there's a little bit of um, a little bit of help in this in knowing that there are like thirty to forty of these super incredible scrubs that don't really have a chance to make the cut, um, and sort of reminds you of the European tour events over in China where they had like just a large group of Chinese guys that have a course history of missing the cut every year by many strokes. They're just kind of there because it's in China. Well, that's how it is here. Um, once you get past the $6,600 range, it's just a giant bucket of people who are going to miss the cut pretty bad. So it might not be as bad as it seems, but you'll still see a lot of good golfers missing the cut because you know, they put up like quadruple bogeys or something when they get into the, the brush, especially guys who are stubborn and won't like take penalty shots or try to knock it out. I'm looking at you, Kevin Na. I'm looking at you. But Kevin Na's already let his frustrations be known to the world, and we'll see plenty of them come this weekend here. But I don't know about you guys, but my Father's Day is going to consist of me kicking back, watching some golf, watching some NASCAR, enjoying time with my daughter. Um, and I hope any of you that have kids out there, I hope you guys have a wonderful Father's Day and enjoy the crappy Fox coverage of the U.S. Open at Aaron Hills. Uh, wish you guys the best of luck this weekend. I'll be around on Slack if you have any questions to ask, and we'll update the odds, drifts, and things as they come along. So... Good luck this week, and I will see you next week when we have to consider playing freaking Bubba Watson at the Travelers. <laughs> see ya. Thank you for listening to the DFS Army podcast. Join the DFS Army today and gain access to our private Slack chat, where you can chat with real DFS pros and coaches, as well as other DFS Army members with winning track records. Also included in your membership is access to our premium articles, DFS Army weighted projections for every sport we offer, from NFL to MMA, weekly player picks and cheat sheets, the strategy vault of timeless concepts, and the DFS Army Domination Station, a truly state-of-the-art lineup optimizer, offering your personal projections or ours. The DFS Army membership is the best value across the industry. Join today and get two free ebooks as well as the secrets to unlocking a new level to your game.